let's talk a little bit about how you got started in shooting. Um, and I'm really kind of speaking towards like the type of folks that have never really uh, gone to a class or never shot a match. Like if you could talk to it in, in terms of that, then, you know, that'd be great. I'm, I'm really interested sure. in that. Well, I mean, I guess that all starts when I was a little kid. So this is, this is like, you know, explanation of, wow, I feel like most of the things that I have done in life, honestly. So I come from hippies uh, and I was, uh, you know, from a, the first place I lived was, you know, next to a marsh near a river down on the Oregon coast. And uh, it just was readily apparent to me from the beginning. Um, I mean, from literally from the time that I can remember the earliest thoughts that I remember well, many thoughts, but you know, some of the earliest realizations of anything at all that I can remember was, you know, you look out the world, look out the window and you see the natural world and stuff lives and stuff dies. And it does that based hugely on its ability to protect itself. And, uh, you know, we'd, my mom would take me, you know, we'd go walk down on the marsh and there's, you know, there's dead stuff around cause it's a, it's a wild place, right? There's like the dead fish that you can see down in, uh, in the, in the river and that's cool. And, you know, there's crabs running around down in the bottom of the river and that's cool. And there's, you know, birds and all kinds of things. And they're all looking around trying to eat each other. Um, that's what they're doing. They're, they're, they're trying to continue to exist. And so, I mean, from the time I've been a little kid, I've always, seen self-defense and, and, and so then, and I guess this is also where the, you know, comes part of partly where the comes from hippies parts, uh, part comes in is, is, you know, I think, um, I consider, you know, we don't, we don't usually talk about it in these terms in the shooting world, but especially as a, uh, truthful, but not obvious answer that I give to people outside the shooting world, this is human rights work. That's what this is. All of it. It's at different levels. It's addressing different audiences. That's all true, but it is all human rights work. I believe that the most fundamental human right from which all other human rights are derived is the right to protect your own physical body. And that has to include the care, the ownership, access, and carriage of the tools attendant to that right. Because if you don't include that, then that means the right belong right that right to uh, belongs to the many, the mean, the large, the male. You know, instead of everybody who is not that the biggest and the strongest or banded together, right? Then it only belongs to them. Um, so you know, that's like my deepest statement of personal philosophy from the time I've been a little kid. I, that's I, I've always believed that very, very strongly, and so. And, and then combined with, you know, I could see even as a young kid, what, it, where I was from, who I was from and what we were like. And I'm, you know, I'm nice. I'm like, and, 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 and if you take it back to like when I was a kid in school, I'm like, you know, the smart kid and into art and stuff like you would expect coming from hippies. And, um, and knowing I, I could see that that was the way that I was and where I came from, from by virtue of nurture. And that if I did not feel, if I did not fix the weakness, then I would just be very weak and unable to, unable to provide for myself. Um, and, and in this sense, in the self self protective sense, but, but effectively that that was a major, major personal via both nature and nurture. Cause it's, you know, I'm like, I'm skinny and I'm nice and I'm not big and mean and don't want to hurt anybody. Um, that if I didn't fix that about myself and develop those capabilities, then I would have none. And then that, and, and I think from the time I've been a little kid, I think that's a very foolish place to allow yourself to be if you can help it. Um, so here I am, you know, decades later in huge part, the entirety of my life having been spent, you know, in whatever way, slowly and steadily correcting that personal weakness. Like to the point that here I am teaching it, which is completely weird because, you know, you, you know how there's these, there are these established routes to kind of become a minor firearms instructor. Usually, you know, you go to a school, whether wh whatever kind that is, you know, whatever school that is, usually you go to a school long enough, do a good job. There'll be usually often some route that you end up getting recruited into being a volunteer instructor there, whether it's in a small, very tiny role or a really big role, you know, depending on the school, but that that's like a really common thing. Right. And so there was a time when I was, I was, I was, I started doing that out of the ulterior motive of wanting to continue to be present for training and benefit from it, but 
can't just in the in the forever picture pay a couple hundred dollars a day to do it right like 150 tuition and then ammo and stuff like that's it, i just I, you know i can't pay for that forever um, but would like to continue to be well involved in training so that was kind of a way to do that and then the, I, re, I remember the moment that you know my, my predecessor carl uh at the at the home range here he's unfortunately passed away in 2010 but it was about 2008 or 9 and I was, you know, way into the tactical training program, doing a lot of that stuff, hadn't started competing yet, but was kind of starting to improve technical skills in so far as I knew, knew to do that. And, and he, and we're at dinner after the evening training group. And he looks at me and I don't remember what was being talked about that had relevance to this. I think it was like, you know, it was like the, what do you want to do when you grow up conversation? And obviously I was already grown up ostensibly, but, but coming from hippies, I have like no professional ambition whatsoever. Um, so, so, so I'm like, what do I want to do? I don't know. Have a job that pays the bills and doesn't bug me too much. That's what I want in, in total honesty. That's what I want. That, what kind of job I want? That's the kind of job I want. Right. So like, that's, you know, different than being a high level professional at anything, but that's uh, you know, you have some nice things out of that. You have a very nice quality of life other than money um, is what you, is what you get with that. But anyway, that all aside. So he looks at me and he goes, do you want to be a firearms instructor? And he's like, trying to recruit me to work at the range and i'm like ah no i don't know no i don't know because i love it but i shouldn't be teaching this don't you you should get you know get somebody who's had who who is you know had a whole profession involving you know using using guns and has had to actually use them probably they should be teaching it why should i be teaching it and and so i was pretty pretty reluctant but it was you know ultimately kind of encouraged and cajoled at his his and other people's behest of like no 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 you do a good job so you should do it. it like it doesn't have to be more complicated than that uh you do a good job so you should do it so come come on in apply for the job you know so that was that was kind of how i got started it was kind of kind of recruited kind of encouraged and ultimately is just this is where i'm at right now in this whole lifetime of correcting that weakness and at some point you decided to start shooting matches like, uh, what got you into the competitive scene? I have to credit uh, Todd Green. Todd Green, uh, at the time, so this is about 2008-ish, 2009. Uh, I had been given in early training a, a drop of poison about competition. Uh, not a lot, just like a little bit. And it took me a couple of years to kind of see through that and unlearn it. And Todd was very key to that. So right about that time, I kind of had that drop of poison. I kind of knew that I had it. I was kind of starting to examine that and think about whether that was worthwhile or valid or not, or even accurate. And in part, it was driven by Todd Green posting on the internet. This was back when he was on M4 Carbine. Uh, he would post the numbers from the fast test. And so, it's, you know, you can know what the fast test is. It's really easy to look up the fast, sorry, fast, not fast test. That's redundant. Uh, the fast it's really easy to look that up um, and see, uh, excuse me, see the, uh, see the performance levels uh, or the performance thresholds there. And then to see Todd doing it. And by then I had kind of, and see the numbers that Todd was putting up um, with carry gear from concealment. And that was completely inspirational to me because I was just right about then starting to have a clue about, what are the actual numerical performance thresholds in terms of hits and time associated with like an upper class competitive shooter, a master grandmaster, or frankly, you know, at this point, you know, a B class shooter looks like they jumped out of the matrix compared to, you know, normal people um, or by normal people's perceptions. That's like thoroughly the case. You know, I like this. So I just saw John wick this year, right? Like the, the, I'm, I'm only like 12 years late or whatever. Right? So I finally just saw it and I'm like, Hmm. Yeah. He looks reasonably credible. They're like, people don't have a clue. Like if you had like an actual, what we know as a really good pistol shooter, um, that's like really good and has, you know, some defensive uh, capability as well. And is not, is not, you know, clueless as far as tactics goes, John wick, is like kind of like well you got it done you know good job for you that's the he was he was he was pretty competent but like amazing no no not <laughs> not amazing just uh you know did a did a perfectly fine job <laughs> perfectly fine job that you know anybody with like a few days of handgun training in theory could maybe do if they had the the mental part to do it right um anyway so 
uh i kind of for, forgot where we're going now where were we going <laughs> how you got into how you get how you got uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. so 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 todd green's posted on the internet about about you know here are my numbers from the fast i shot today and here's my numbers from the fast i shot yesterday and all this stuff and it's really good really really good like it's it's like it's like this is this is ballpark master grandmaster level of performance exemplified by somebody using their gear their carry gear from concealment which is exactly just the crystallization of to me the point um because another another major aspect of my life that i that i've done probably in, uh, one of the other huge strands or pillars of life to characterize it as is my whole life is hugely composed of there is some something or activity i come to like and be interested in so i want to learn to do it so i learned to do it as well as i can figure out for like a couple of years and I keep going until I lose interest, which is typically 1.5 to two years in, though that comes from my youth when I had more disposable time. And so maybe it takes longer for me now. I'm not sure. But at whatever point I've gone through like the steep part of the learning curve, and now it's going to get to that part where you're going to grind out a quarter, quarter of a percent after quarter of a percent after quarter of a percent for like a really, really long time. That is when I typically lose interest because it feels like the uh, numerical advantageousness of the steep part of the learning curve has been lost. And kind of like if we were to adapt the phrase from jujitsu of once you're a blue belt, you're just training to beat the other grapplers. Um, I, I have felt and seen that specific um, dynamic, not in jujitsu, because I'm not that far at all, was, was not and am not that far in jujitsu, but the phrase applies just as well to any number of other things. So like, this is like insight to the generalist versus specialist thing. Um, so like sometimes in our world, we talk about stuff like, hey, so like how good is say a Delta person with a pistol? Well, they're probably really good, um, but and that's in the big picture, but that is like one small piece of what they have to be good at, right? They, they, they cannot be a pistol specialist in a, to the exclusion of the other necessary skills that they, that they have to have. They got to be good at 80 things or however many things it is that they have to be good or at least competent at so that they can get to the fight, have enough energy to fight the fight, hit the target in the fight, probably not with their pistol if they could help it, right? Like probably with a different gun, but maybe if it got down to the pistol, then maybe it's with the pistol, right? And I'm making all this up. I don't think any of it's untrue, but you know, I have no personal knowledge of any of those, what those guys really do. But my point is this, they got to be uh, good at a whole bunch of things. And if they come up short on any of those things, game over, they cannot, right? So they have to be much more of a generalist than I have to be. I can be like a complete and total specialist with a handgun. I can be like mega good with a handgun and land navigation what's that that's that's fine for me not fine for a, a, a real soldier but it, you know it's maybe fine for me um so uh anyway uh you know the performance levels that people have in in competition um uh, that kind of also folded into my overall life interest of becoming very good at things or trying to be until they lose my interest and then trying to be good be as very good as i can at something else times however many times i've gone through that in life um and shooting shooting is the one that honestly has persisted the longest and i think that's i'm not i'm not sure why totally sure why that is i've got a few ideas but but shooting has definitely persisted vastly beyond that one and a half to two year time frame and i think it's partly because it's become a profession and it's kind of supported and enjoyed by other people and that helps me you know continue with it and um and now I'm an adult and I have to work uh, and I'm not a youth who did not have to work like I was during that whole formation of the, it seems like it takes me a year and a half to two years to get through the steep part of the learning curve. So maybe I just, you know, don't have as much time now, or maybe I've taken this to a way deeper level. I kind of think that that's, that's also true. I think I'm better at shooting than I've been at any of the other things that I've been good at. Um, but th so, so those things all kind of came together about 2008, 2009. Todd's kind of like showing the example of what you could do with carry gear from concealment. I'm becoming more, aware of the numerical performance thresholds associated with an upper class competitive shooter and thinking of like, Hey, that would be great to be able to exert that with my carry gear from concealment combined with my, a huge part of my life is find something that I love, become as great at it as I can until I don't love it anymore. And then find something else to become great at and love. Man, where's to live by honestly, <laughs> seriously. 